What's up, my wizards? It's Deb. SBMTG here with Ziggy. We like it a magic. Both of us do. And you know what? Game of Thrones might be over, and that's probably, let's face it, for the best. But that doesn't mean we're done talking about dragons. We got a whole deck full of them today. You know, if you want to build dragons right now in the standards, there's a lot of different directions you can go. You can go with like five color dragons, play Nib Mizzet Reborn, and do something really crazy. Or you can go like Grixis dragons, play all the Daddy Bolases if you've got the if you've got the dollars for that. But I'm more of a purist, so I went with mono red dragons. But it actually ain't that simple, everybody. What we're actually gonna do is play a bunch of Planeswalkers in our dragons deck. Sounds weird, but we have to because Sarkin the Masterless is pretty much the best card with the word dragon printed on it in all of standard right now. This might be one of the first decks you've seen all season that actually takes advantage of the first like line of text on Sarkin. Usually his passive isn't that big of a deal, but like we'll actually have dragons on the battlefield during our opponent's turn that we didn't make with Sarkin. <laughs> It's, it's kind of crazy how that works, but yeah, this card can make multiple dragons over the course of a game, or just effectively be a 5-mana 4-4 four, four dragon the turn it comes out. That also leaves you with a, you know, a low-loyalty Planeswalker. So that's nice, but what we're mostly trying to do is play Sarkin the way that a lot of people are playing Sarkin. You just play a bunch of Planeswalkers in your deck, and then the turn you play Sarkin, you swing over for, I don't know, 28 flying. You know, it turns out we can do that in our deck and still play actual dragons too. Now, another cool thing about playing this Sarkin is that we also get to play this Sarkin. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. You know, we used to have the Planeswalker uniqueness rule, the purr. Ziggy knows a little bit about purr. And um, we don't have that anymore. It turns out you can just have the three mana Sarkin and the five mana Sarkin on the battlefield at the same time because who cares about flavor or continuity or anything, right? <laughs> They're just going to meet each other, and I guess that's cool, but hey, I mean, that's good news for us. You know, we can play Sarkin on turn three and then Sarkin on turn five and uh, have both of them out at the same time. <laughs> Again, nothing but good news for us, and we do have like six actual dragons in the main deck that this allows us to ramp into and cast really, really easily on, you know, ahead of schedule most of the time. So that's nice. But we also get a looter tool. You know, extra card draw is always worth it. And even if we have to dump a card in our graveyard, we're usually fine with doing that so long as we find the pieces that we need. So a piece of like pretty good card draw on turn three is always nice to have in a deck that's looking for a lot of specific pieces like this one is. And of course, you can always just ultimate this eventually. You know, it's not going to happen in most games, but in games where you can ultimate, it can actually not only just end the game on the spot, obviously, but if it doesn't, then it just makes Sark and the Masterless that much better because you put a bunch of dragons into play that'll proc if your opponent does try to get in on you. But I guess the, the main attraction here is the dragons and not the Sarkins. We're playing more Planeswalkers than just a bunch of Sarks, but I figure I might as well take a break from those for just a second. Go ahead and show you the dragons so you don't riot. First off, we're going to play three copies of Skargan Hellkite. Now, we can't have too many five drops in the deck. We do have Sarkin to help us kind of ramp into this some of the time, but I also don't want to play like eight or nine <laughs> five drops. So you're not going to see four copies of this or any demanding dragons or anything like that. Turns out Skargan Hellcat is the only other five drop in the deck that I really want to play if we're just trying to play the best cards we can, you know. But this is obviously a very good card. <laughs> it comes down as a 4-4 haste against control decks some of the time, or it can just come down and start wrecking like aggro decks, and even mid-range decks, especially when you're able to start activating it twice in the same turn. This gives us a really important like mana sink you know, protects us from flood because we will flood out some games. And this really helps us spend our mana on all those turns where we just like draw a mountain or something that we don't need. <laughs> We're looking for action. This is guaranteed action on every turn if we have nothing better to do. And if nothing else, it's always just going to be this ridiculous threat. So yeah, we'll, we'll play a few copies of the best red dragon, the best mono red dragon. <laughs> Again, you have to be careful. Nick Bolas is red. The best mono red dragon in the format. But that doesn't mean that we're done with dragons because we're also playing a couple of copies of Varric's Bladewing down here in the four drop slot. But of course, this can be an eight drop too. And Sarkin Fireblood can help us get to this way ahead of schedule as well. Like, this is an amazing top deck. And even the mid to late game, but especially the late game, you know, you rip this on turn 9 or 10, it's very likely you're going to be able to kick this into play and just get a couple of huge dragons. Like, this doesn't end games by itself or anything, but it really goes a long way towards increasing your board state and swinging the game your way. 
Oh, and if you are able to kick it, by the way, this is something else that works really well with Sark and the Masterless. You know, you'll get two dragons to proc when you get attacked into, so long as you have a Masterless in play. So, this does a lot of stuff in this deck, too. It's not just a 4-4 four, four flyer. But if you do play it on turn 4, you know, into, say, a Sarkin on turn 5, that's a pretty good line, too. So, even if you get this on curve... It's not bad, but top deck, it's a beast too. It's just pretty good at all points in the game. And even if you're behind, this represents a really good blocking body. But to finish off the main deck dragons, we're also playing one copy of Lathless, Dragon Queen. And I know what you're thinking, no queen, but actually, yes, with a bunch of A's, queen. This card is actually a little bit better than it looks too. You know, six mana is at the very tip top of our curb. I mean, we're playing dragons, y'all. <laughs> we're gonna play, we're gonna play some six mana cards in the deck. But Sarkin can also help us ramp into this on turn 5, you know, or even turn 4, <laughs> which is pretty quick to be playing a Lathless. This works with all of our natural dragons, but it also works if Sarkin, you know, plus 1s and gets 2 or 3 Planeswalkers to turn into dragons. Suddenly, that, that ability didn't cost us any mana. We have all of our mana open to, you know, pump dragons that get through for combat damage. Or even dragons that, you know, get blocked or whatever. We can pump them to kill whatever blocked them if we have to. So, a lot of use on the, the fire-breathing ability on Lathless. And don't forget that she's just a 6-6 flyer. And, like, that's that's bigger than most things in this format right now. So, if you just drop a Lathless, it's at the very least going to block against the most important flyers in the format and trade with them. But for the most part, if you drop a Lathless, you're just going to be attacking for a buttload of damage every single turn. Like, if you just have a Lathless and, like, literally nothing else out, your opponent often has to block, like, nine damage on the next turn. And that's bad enough, but when this starts combining with a bunch of Planeswalkers that turned into dragons, that's when things get out of control. Trust me, the one copy of Lathless is what you want to be doing. But back to the Planeswalkers here. I told you we're playing a bunch, like 18 to be exact, in this deck because we really want Sarkin to pop off here. But to that end, we have to play some three mana Planeswalkers other than just Fireblood in the deck. So instead of these, you know, pretty valuable creatures Red can play, I instead went with, first of all, Tibble. Now, Rakish Instigator is a lot better than it's getting credit for, and it's sneaking into red sideboards. You know, at first it was a one of in red sideboards, and a two of. Now it's a three of in most modern red sideboards because this, just the passive on this is invaluable in this meta. You know, keeping them from gaining life is going to be pretty important against, first of all, Absorb, which is maybe the most important thing this card fights against. But there's also things like, you know, incidentals like Wild Growth Walker. That's a very important card to have Instigator against. But, you know, even smaller stuff. Uh, Night of Autumn, you know, doesn't see all the play in the world, but it's very good uh, for a lot of reasons. Against the Mono Red decks, it gets sided in a lot against them. And the, you know, the Bant Vivian deck plays multiple copies of it. So this is good against that card as well. A lot of incidental life gain in this format, especially on the early ladders of Arena. You see a lot of people playing the Ajani's Pride Mate, you know, Black White Ajani's Pride Mate deck. But this will keep people off of, again, you know, more played standard cards like Soren, Vengeful Bloodlord, you know, just shuts off Lifelink. There's an awful lot of good things about this card. Shuts off Lara Dawnbringer, you know, Resplendent Angel. There's just a ton of stuff this card does, and it doesn't look like it at first glance. And I haven't even talked about the fact that it's Creature Factory, too, so that's pretty good if you're looking for something to block for a couple of turns against aggro, or even just to put things on the board against, you know, control and give you a little bit of wrath protection. Like, this card plays a little bit better than most three drops in the format right now if you're not looking to be specifically aggressive on turn three. And since turn three is still kind of a setup turn for us, Rakish Instigator is actually an all-star card. But we're not done with three mana Planeswalkers. That, we're, we're kind of getting up there with three mana Walkers at this point, but we still got to make room for a couple of copies of Saheeli. And honestly, I think that you, we could at least play three copies of Saheeli and get away with it in this deck. We've only got, like, six actual creatures in the main deck. Like, every other card in the main deck is a non-creature spell and is going to proc this. You know, so that's, that's actually ends up being really good. I've been playing Saheeli and Mono Blue Planeswalkers this deck for a good long time now. And obviously Saheeli is one of the pieces, like the biggest, um, you know, binding factor. She's kind of the one of the glue pieces in the Jeskai Planeswalkers deck, which actually just picked up like all three spots of the top three of a tournament last weekend. Like that's a pretty powerful deck. And Saheeli is one of the most important pieces in that deck. And she functions very much the same. 
in this one. I mean, almost every single one of our plays is non-creature, so this is going to help us fill our board, and I really like the function of being able to not only protect our Planeswalkers by playing non-creature spells, you know, if we play a piece of removal, while Sahili's out, we're removing a creature, thus protecting a Planeswalker. We're also putting a, a blocker out, thus protecting a Planeswalker. You know, just turn three Sahili into turn four Planeswalker can be a good enough play line a lot of the time. Because simply by playing that second Planeswalker, you've picked up a blocker that can protect technically both Planeswalkers against an attacking creature. So that's that can be a really important line some of the time, but Sahili just generates so much value as the game goes on. And the longer the game gets, the more value you're going to get out of Sahili. This has the function of also being able to turn a servo into a dragon some of the time, which is really, it's obviously really good too. It just helps you get more you through for more combat damage. Or you can leave those servos to hold down the ground for you and block while you get through in the air with your dragons. There's just too many things Sahili does in the deck. And she's also really good alongside Karn, which we're playing a couple of copies of. Not the four mana Planeswalker that I want to be playing the most in this deck, but it's definitely a four mana Planeswalker I want to be playing. You know, not only are we playing with Sahili, which generates artifacts, thus making this a little bit better, or at least the last ability on it a little bit better. Um, but we're also playing another artifact in this deck a little bit later on, we'll talk about it, that this works pretty well with too. So just as a creature factory, this can be pretty decent sometimes. And I've already talked about the play of Sahili into turn four Planeswalker is good enough. But if you go Sahili into turn four Karn, make a Servo, and then make a Golem, then you've got a lot of Planeswalker protection out of that play. And, by the way, while we're talking about play sequences, Sahili into Karn, tick up one, get your servo, turn you know turn five, Sarkin, get your servo, make your two Planeswalkers into dragons. That is also pretty freaking good as far as play sequences go. So this deck has a fair amount of versatility in the way that it can play out the first five or six turns of the game. And again, this card is a big part of that, you know. We need a few four mana Planeswalkers. Again, this isn't the only one, but this just does so much. It gets us card advantage over the course of a game, especially, again, just like Sahili, the longer the game goes on, the better Karn tends to get. And if we have a big enough board to turn this comes out, let's say we've been working with Sahili for two, three turns, and then we draw a Karn and drop it, well, sometimes we can make a 4-4 four, four, or a 5-5 five, five on the turn Karn comes out and have plenty of ways of protecting it on board, too. So Karn is just absolutely ridiculous and works specifically well with Sahili, but while we're looking to play Planeswalkers, why not play Karn? But the four mana Planeswalker I do want to play in the deck is Fire Artisan. So we're going to play all four copies of this. We've already seen the mono red decks first adopt four copies of this and then go down to two here in recent weeks. They just play four copies of Experimental Frenzy now. But down to two copies, they're still playing Chandra in their deck. And you can see why. Just an extra card every single turn. If your opponent ever wants to attack into it, they're going to be taking some damage. Thus making them a little bit more susceptible to burn spells or attacks on the next turn. So sometimes your opponent's just going to let you have the Chandra because they cannot feasibly attack into it without losing too much life. So you just get a Howling Mine of your own every turn, and that's a really, really powerful effect. Not to mention just, obviously, the basic playline of Chandra into Sarkin is nuts. So yeah, play play all four Chandra. But we're not done with Planeswalkers. We actually have one more here. Um, and it's technically a dragon. It doesn't have that type line or anything, but we're playing a copy of Ugin in the deck. And this is actually really important for mono-red decks to play a copy of Ugin, and I don't know why more don't. We're not seeing as much mono-red mid-range, which is the deck that would want to play a copy of Ugin, obviously. We're mostly seeing a lot of mono-red aggro right now, as usual. But if mono-red wants to be a mid-range deck, I really would think they'd always play a copy of this, because it allows them to take out, like, enchantments and planeswalkers and other permanents they don't often have the goods to take out like yeah we got burn and stuff for planeswalkers but sometimes a lightning strike just ain't enough to kill a teferi right so that's where ugin comes in and just having something that can kill that teferi or that liliana that's ticked up way too much that gideon that's ticked up a little bit too much to kill with a burn spell you know it's gonna be invaluable against plus like search for his kanta right wilderness reclamation there's a bunch of <laughs> enchantments in the format right now, too. I just talked about Experimental Frenzy and Mono Red. There's a ton of enchantments that you want to break as well in this format. You can help you do that while advancing your board state, if that's what you want to do. You know, playing Karns for two mana. There's a lot of good stuff about Ugin in this deck. Now, the rest of the stuff in the deck is like various non-creature spells. You know, we're playing a bunch of removal, like, you know, four Lightning Strike, 
three shock. I feel like we got to play these nowadays. You know, especially shock. We're not seeing quite as much aggro, although mono red is a definite scourge in the format. And shock is going to take out the majority of the creatures that they play, but it also takes out a bunch of mono white creatures, mono blue creatures when you come across that. Kills hero of precinct one, which is becoming more and more important as like Esper hero becomes a real deck. So... You know, a lot of things <laughs> that this deals with. Like Grow Chamber Guardian, the turn they tap out for it. You know, if they play Grow Chamber on turn two, this will go ahead and kill it. And a bunch of other stuff. You know, 10th District Legionnaire, they tap out for it on turn two. Go ahead and swing in with it. Shock will deal with that. Lawn or Elves. It's just, shock is indispensable right now. And at the very least, you can point it at Planeswalkers if you got nothing else to do with it. So all of that same thing goes, you know, with Lightning Strike. It's just a little bit bigger than Shock. You know, Banalish Marshall and a bunch of other three toughness creatures. This is going to remove for you where Shock can't. So we just got to play these spells. But we're also playing a Spit Flame in the deck. Over a card like Lava Coil because I just, I wanted another Dragon payoff. We got the Lathless. We got the Sarkin. We're, we're paying off Dragons a little bit. But I specifically didn't want to play a card like, say, Dragon's Horde. Which was the worst card in the deck. <laughs> when it was in the deck. And, you know, Dragon's Horde can ramp us into stuff, um, you know, things that aren't even dragons. Like, it can ramp us into a turn four Sarkin or something. And it will draw some cards over the course of the game, but it's just super low impact. You don't want to take off turn three to do it, blah, blah, blah. But if we are looking for dragon payoffs, Spit Flame is actually one of the better ones. Note how well this works with Sarkin. You know, you don't have to actually play a natural dragon creature. You can just play your Sarkin, minus him for the token, and when that comes into play, get your Spit Flame back. Actually, there is one more thing I want to point out about this. You know, three mana Sarkin makes you discard stuff. And this is pretty much the only thing in the deck that you really have absolutely no problem discarding whatsoever. You know, a lot of the times you'll discard lands or like removal spells you don't need at the time or like a Planeswalker you don't plan on playing or something like a Planeswalker you already have a copy of in play. That happens a lot with Sarkin Fireblood. But it is nice to have a card that you can more or less consequence free just toss in the bin. So this is a good card for that function as well. But to finish off the deck, we're going to play three copies of Treasure Map. Really good play against slower decks. Again, like Control and Nexus, this gives us a little bit of ramp as the game goes on. The Scries to help us draw the cards that we need to draw. All that's great. Plus, it works so well with, like, uh, Karn when it does flip over. You know, it gives you not only an artifact to go ahead and help you start making bigger goblins. Uh, golems. Goblin Golem is what I was going for there. Make bigger golems. <laughs> <laughs> but also, when Treasure Map flips over, it gives you the treasures, and that'll help you make much bigger golems with Karn. That's really impactful. Plus, it's another card draw tool once it does flip over. It gives us the ramp to get to stuff like Lathless or Ugin if we haven't gotten to six mana yet. It's just so much that Treasure Map does, and it's a great two mana play, especially early in the game. Against decks where like our removal spells aren't as impactful, like Lightning Strike, isn't a great two mana play on turn two against Esper, for instance. Whereas something like this is amazing to go ahead and get down in the early game. So, yeah, Treasure Map gets in, definitely. This isn't a lot of mid-range decks um, has exactly that, you know, a turn two play that isn't a removal speller, isn't a creature. Some decks want that. We definitely do. And Treasure Map fits the bill and does so much for us in the scheme of things that we definitely need to play at least the three of. Now, one of my favorite things about the Mono Red Dragons decks, like over other Dragons decks, especially in the format, um, is the mana base. You know, because we get to play 25 lands here, but we only have to play like 18 or 20 mountains. I think 18 is enough because we'll get to Sarkin Fireblood like 93% of the time or something if we play 18 sources. But I've gone ahead and gone up to 20 red sources here to make absolutely sure that we'll never have any problems getting the sources that we need on a given turn while we still get the opportunity to play these colorless lands. And you could go a different way. You could play Arch Varazka or something if you wanted, but I felt like we definitely needed Blast Zone, you know, especially against these aggro decks. Sometimes they can put us on the back foot in the early game. Well, Blast, Blast Zone can come down and just uncounterably kill all of their one drops which is good against literally every aggro deck in the format right now no matter what mono color it might be so that's we need blast zone if you're going to put any colorless land in your deck i'd say this is the one but there's also field of ruin which can keep our opponent off of obviously search for his kanta we do not want our opponent to flip a search for his kanta at all so <laughs> field of ruin can kill the search if they actually do get us kanta plus like you know adanto the first fort and a bunch of other stuff that might matter we're not the only ones playing treasure map in the format for instance so this actually has a good amount of targets right now but there's also a karn's bastion you can go a lot of different directions i actually considered playing interplanar beacon as a four of in this deck i am doing that in mono blue walkers currently 
But I didn't opt to do that in this deck. Again, go any direction you want to here. I'm still not sure which one is correct, but... Karn's Bastion is ridiculous. Now, I've mostly been flexing this deck in best of one, but there are definitely reasons you might want to sideboard in the deck. Our Fiery Cannonade in there, this will obviously get rid of a bunch of aggro creatures, and it's the best sweeper we could play. We don't even play creatures on the low end of the curve, and this might be able to work its way into the early, you know, the actual main deck, especially if you're playing strictly best of one on Arena. This is worth considering for the main. But do note that it does kill your servos, your Tibolt tokens, and all that. But in any case, we need this against aggro in most games. We've also got Direfleet Daredevil. Now, this is specifically against Control. Really important card right now. There's a reason its price keeps going up. Lava Coil price keeps going down, but still very, very important sideboard card. Basically, one of the main rules is that if you know you're playing against a deck that's mostly creatures or an aggro deck, something like that, you'll side in Lava Coil. Anytime you know you'll have targets for your removal spells, side in Lava Coil over Lightning Strike. Anyway, though, we've also got another copy of Tibble in there, mostly to keep decks off of gaining life that really, really badly want to do that, but also to expand our board state against control decks. We've also got Fight with Fire. This mostly comes in when we sniff out Lyra Dawnbringer in games two and three. And really when I say Lyra, just sub in five toughness creature, <laughs> you know, but also to finish it off, there's a copy of Ugin the Ineffable. This is just an insurance policy if we need to kill more Planeswalkers, if we need to kill more enchantments, or if they just have huge creatures we can't otherwise kill, like a 6-6 six, six or something like that, then this will come in and help finish those jobs for us. Plus, this is another tool that can help us expand our board state against slower decks or grindier decks. This is an invaluable tool against them. Like Soltai, pretty good card against. But here are your power rankings. I know you've been patiently awaiting them. 66 is the final score for this deck, which, you know, not the highest score, obviously. It's not like 68, 69, super competitive, tier 1, play this deck now. But it is a really high score for a deck that's south of $200 right now. Now, there are some expensive pieces. Obviously, the Karns are like 17 bucks a piece. Direfleet Daredevil is like 750 a piece, you know. Ugin is like 550. There are some things in here, you know, Chandra's like 5 bucks a piece. There's some things in here that cost a little bit of money, but for the most part, you can, you know, take out I guess you take out the Blast Zones, take out the Karns, and then suddenly you're down, you know, like 60 bucks. Like you can play this deck for a really really affordable price if you just made a few shifts here and there, and it wouldn't hurt the deck as much as it could. Let me just put it that way. Now, even though the deck does have a pretty decent final score, 66, again, nothing to sneeze at. Anything past the mid-60s or in the mid-60s, it's a pretty decent deck most of the time. But you'll also notice most of these scores aren't necessarily mediocre, but they're only slightly above average. A lot of sixes and sevens here. It's because the deck isn't super offensive until the later turns of the game. It's also not super defensive, you know? We only have a handful of removal spells in here, plus Ugin. But even the removal spells we do have, except for Ugin, can't take out any old creature. They have sort of a ceiling on them. So even though we have some defense in the deck, we're not super tooled for defense. We're very much a mid-range deck that wants to get into the late game and start dropping like ridiculous bomby garbage and just take over the game with our big dudes. Pretty tried and true way to play Magic, but it can leave us a little bit naked in the early game, and it can leave us a little bit counterable, to say the least, in the mid and late game. If nothing else, we just present threat after threat after threat that is must deal with, and that's probably the deck's biggest strength. You know, that's probably any mid-range deck's biggest strength, and this doesn't have the problem of absolutely needing its sideboard like a lot of mid-range decks do. This deck plays very well in best of one for the most part, even without, you know, a sweeper like Fiery Cannonade or an exile removal spell like Lava Coil or whatever. It still plays very well in the BO1 environment because, again, past turn three or whatever, you're just presenting an absolutely must-answer threat on pretty much every turn of the game, and a lot of decks can't deal with that. So get this thing shot if you possibly can. Again, just a little south of 200 bucks, but plenty of ways to finagle it to way under that dollar amount. So even if you just pick up, like, all the Planeswalkers minus the Karns for the deck, then you're on your way to making a really good deck. <laughs> In that case, just mono red planeswalkers is a good enough deck by itself, but when you throw in these dragons, it just becomes a deck that like plays ridiculous garbage every turn, and if even one thing gets through, it threatens to either swing the time of the game or you just win outright. <laughs> you know, one or the other. So try this thing out if you can, and if you like Dargons, 
it's a pretty sweet deck. So go over to TCG Player, link in the description, the first link in the description, as a matter of fact, to check out the deck list, order any pieces that you need, yada yada, at the lowest prices on the interwebs. Aside from that, like the video if you enjoyed the video, hit subscribe and ring the bell for notifications so you know what's going on on my channel. That's important. To actually be notified, I don't, I, I, I think that a lot of my subscribers aren't getting notified because I keep getting comments like, hey, I wasn't notified about this video, I just saw it like three days after you uploaded it. So I get that comment a lot. I don't know if YouTube's trying to screw me, but make sure you ring the bell for the notifications. When you get them, you'll get them. <laughs> anyway, you can also check out the Patreon if you want to support content like this. Um, it's just a dollar a month, but you can also do $5 for a sign card, $10 for a sign card, deck doctor, and your name in the credits. But just a buck lets you vote for what deck you want to see next, let you know what hap what happens on the channel 24 hours in advance before I upload it, you know. So, a lot of value for a buck, just whatever you want to do, get over there to the Patreon and pledge. But if you don't want to do that, that's cool. I just appreciate you being here, watching this far into the video. You could have left forever ago. But anyway, I think I'm actually done for this one. So, I suppose I'll catch you cats later. Just let me know how you felt about it down there in the comments section. I know that some Dragons players are going to have been excited for like a 20 Dragons deck, but I don't know that it's doable and standard. I think Planeswalkers is the best we can do right now. Plus, you still get a bunch of dragon payoffs and a bunch of actual dragons. So, I hope it. I hope you liked it. I, I really do. But voice your grievances in the comment section, and I'll catch you cats later. I'm Deb from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.